Welcome everyone to RVA Tech's Tech It Yourself webinar series. Today we're joined by representatives from Impact Makers who will dive into how to accelerate analytics via Data Vault. We have David Moxley, Senior Consultant in Data Science, along with Brett Burnham, Lead Consultant in Architecture and Engineering. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box and we'll address, address them towards the end. With that, Brett and David, I'll let you all take it away. Okay, thank you so much. David, go ahead and uh, start sharing whenever you're ready. So welcome to the webinar on accelerating analytics via Data Vault. So it, given, yes, it's 2020 and COVID, uh, you might hear a bird chirping, my dog barking, or a general interruption. So let's just, um, just go with it, however it works. Uh, let's go ahead and start with introductions. Um, once again, I'm Brett Burnham, uh, and with me is my esteemed colleague, David Moxley. He is our senior data science consultant. He also plays many roles as far as he's an incredible engineer, as well as a visualiz visualization expert and all around great guy. So um, it'll be, it'll be great, a great presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, everybody, for attending us. Attending. Uh, there's a visualization expert. Uh, Brett, I think there's there's something different about you. I can't. It's, you have different hair? Less hair, maybe? Is that what's going on? I mean, let me get this straight, David. You're you're a data scientist. I'm giving you two points of data right here. On the left is me in December of 2019, and in the middle is me in 2020. And all you see is the lack of hair. Causation does not equal correlation, and the plural of anecdotes is not data, my friend. So I don't uh, see we get a larger sample size. But. We'll go with that. Okay. So if you're just joining us, I'm Brett Burnham, lead consultant with Impact Makers, and with me is. David Moxley, Moxley um, some guy that I work with. So let's go ahead and get started. And so at Impact Makers, we work with both commercial and public sector clients, specifically helping to address their data needs. So what we have seen and what we are seeing in the industry is that most of the time, the use case and the hypothesis are there. The business knows what they want. The real hang up is getting the data to the business and to the data scientists in a way that is accessible, integrated, trusted, and understood. So we are here today to describe a method that is faster and more reliable, an approach to delivering data to meet those business use cases and to make the data available for those people like David who are data scientists. So we do this by timely delivery of business value. That's the time to value solutions that are tailored to the client needs, incremental delivery of scalable holistic solutions, and more specifically in today's example, a single architecture solution for both self-service analytics as well as advanced analytics. So in order to demonstrate this, we're gonna walk you through a composite client. It's uh, fictitious, um, but it's really a culmination of a lot of our combined experiences with uh, some of our financial services um, clients, as well as our expertise. So uh, with that, so that our composite, composite client we're gonna to discuss today um, is kind of taking on the role of a growing community bank. So a lot of, a lot of momentum, a lot of desire for digital transformation, uh, but they're not necessarily there. Um, they've undergone a recent leadership change, which is part of the impetus for this digital transformation and desire to focus on um, analytics and uh, ways to improve uh, their current analytics and, of course, expand upon them. Um, but also, they're facing a more immediate challenge in the form of new regulatory requirements. So what this particularly means for us here uh, is they're presenting us with four immediate pain points. Um, you know, they have this painfully manual financial reporting process of cumbersome spreadsheets uh, that require interventions from multiple departments just to yield a balance sheet and income statement. Um, the examiners, however, have come through and asked that uh, you know, this report be delivered to them on a monthly basis. So now you got to make sure you have co uh, continuity across uh, your different departments in terms of a single source of truth for these important financial metrics. 
but also you have that uh, request from senior leadership that they might be able to work at a more enhanced frequency. Uh, but none of this is possible uh, without some sort of integrated uh, data source to serve both these reporting needs, as well as um, projections uh, to deliver, you know, five-year looks at various financial metrics. Um, data currently is not at all centralized from their core system, and they have multiple ancillary and secondary, or tertiary rather, systems uh, of data. And all this is going to have to operate under a compressed uh, 12 week or so turnaround time. Um, however, as we're delivering this to them and, and trying to get the solution out the door uh, and user ready in 12 weeks, uh, we want to make sure we're not saddling them with a, a boatload of technical debt uh, and also that we're acknowledging their larger digital transformation vision by, by addressing several key strategic objectives. And so as David mentioned, it's not just tactical, it's also strategic. And so we have to look out for whatever is put in place can accommodate the long-term vision, the rapid growth, either a merger or acquisition. There also has to be room and accommodation for self-service. And it's not just about the reporting, but it's also about being able to accommodate the predictive as well as prescriptive analytics. And then there is a recognition and a need for governance, as well as something I call data transparency. It's the data has to be discoverable it has to be, have the proper lineage, it has to be understandable and with common definitions. So, as I mentioned at the outset, um, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be looking more at the analytics role, but also kind of considering what the client voice would be. Um, so we want to just take a second to really articulate what the business need is. Um, at the moment, you know, you have this uh, Excel only report system uh, that's very limited both in functionality and of course, uh, cumbersome and time consuming to develop. Um, they don't, as a result, have the necessary patterns nor capacity um, to scale this to meet the regulatory requests or the frequency um, that the leadership would like to see. Uh, and they lack the, the data and capability for advanced analytics. So where they'd like to see us transition um, is to focus on, on two primary areas in business intelligence and advanced analytics. Um, first is delivering um, a stable reporting solution for the balance sheet and income statements, and again, tracked on a weekly basis for senior leadership. Uh, and second, uh, capacity to provide multi-year projections um, for the examiners that need to be substantiated and built off real data. Uh, year over year averages in this instance will not suffice. Um, but for anybody that's ever done this sort of work, uh, you'll, you'll know intuitively that these two things typically require two very different sorts of data sources. Um, so, you know, of course, you have variables and granularity differences, uh, differences in the length of history, uh, as well as some requirements for business logic and some requirements for feature engineer features, rather, um, that don't mesh across the two uh, verticals there. With BI reports, typically you have a very well defined um, use case with very specific variables, often. Um, derived based on some inherent business logic um, at a set granularity and a defined portion of history. Uh, in contrast, in advanced analytics or machine learning, uh, choose your poison there. Uh, it, it's a lot more exploratory in nature where you want the, great, the greatest depth and breadth of data, the full data fidelity, uh, in order to determine what and where uh, the signal lives. So, while variables may be partially defined by the underlying business theory, uh, they're not exhaustively defined. And you would be obviously limited if you started with a star schema or some sort of business layer developed for BI reports and intended to build a model off of that. So uh, with that in mind, we're able to then decide what methodology can address both of these problems for us on the data end. Okay. And so we need to build a modern data ecosystem. And so I would encourage you to uh, check back at the older RVA Tech Teach It Yourself series. Our colleagues, Tara Mason and John Pimlet, back in September gave a webinar entitled Delivering Business Value with a Modern Data Ecosystem. And in some respects, this webinar is a continuation or a, um, a deeper dive from that. So there's definitely something to check out for more of a generalized view of this modern data ecosystem. So in order to do that, we need to choose a methodology. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a couple of different of the traditional methods for delivering these kinds of systems, and then we're going to choose one. So uh, spoiler alert, if you saw the name of the uh, presentation, we're probably going to choose a data vault, but let's see what happens. Okay. And so what we have here, we have the traditional methods. And so, and this is not meant to be a comparison of Kimball versus Inman versus data vault. This is really going to be a condensed version of, of the whole comparison, uh, method, the whole comparison methodology. First you had Bill Inman, you had the corporate information factory. It was a big bang type of um, implementation. It was uh, slow to value. Um, some of the details about it, it was a third number of form. It was flexible in the sense that you had all the atomic data in one place. You have one place to update, one place of reference for subsequent layers. Um, and even Inman said he didn't necessarily have to have the consumption layer be in third number form. That could be a Ralph Kimball. And so um, that, some of the disadvantages of that besides the Big Bang was this concept of the single source of truth. And this is really true in either Kimball or Inman where you have this fallacy of you can model and you can build something that is right for everybody. And we're gonna get more into this later, but it's something that we think is a, is a fallacy. Um, with Inman also the, the, um, the ETL is, um, more cumbersome as far as you have more layers, you need specialists to be able to do the data modeling. And it is, um, it's overall, not, I wouldn't necessarily out of fashion, but um, most of the data warehouses I've worked on in the past uh, 20 years have been uh, uh, the Ralph Kimball method. And by Ralph Kimball, that's the one on the right over here. The advantages of that are really in the consumption. The star schema model is easily understood by business users. BI tools for the most part are geared towards a dimensional or a star schema model. The querying methods and patterns are more efficient than trying to get something out of a third normal form for at least for reporting and analytical purposes. And it's um, smaller footprint, easier to maintain, less, less hops. Uh, but there are definitely disadvantages. If you've worked on a data warehouse um, in the past, you probably know it's not all roses. The data is not fully integrated beforehand. So if you miss something in your consumption layer, you really have to go back to the start, back to the source. Um, the dimensional model is really cumbersome to adjust to change. If you ever had to um, reload a type two dimension or go from a type one to type two, uh, it is uh, it is cumbersome. It's not insurmountable, but it's just one of those challenges with the, uh, the Kimball dimensional modeling. It is process focused instead of not necessarily uh, enterprise focus. Um, and it does serve as a relatively poor system, system of historical record. Um, in that sense, uh, data in a dimensional model is not, is only really as faithful to the history of the source system across dimensions to the extent, to the extent that the, the dimensions are related to facts. Uh, I can't dive too deep into that right now, but needless to say, it's not a good place to have your archive data. Um, and two of the biggest hangups with these two methods are really they rely heavily on the ETL or extract transformation load pattern to move data across. And so let's dive a little deeper into ETL in the next slide. And so this is the old school extract uh, stage, cleanse, transform, and then you load. and with this, it's really subject uh, specific logic. It's not well suited for automation. Um, the model for model changes that can require developers to go back to the source for historical data. So if you screw something up on the end, you have to go back to the beginning. It really assumes transformation and cleansing requirements are acceptable enterprise wide. It, it kind of you're kind of saying that the transformation that I'm going to do beforehand is what everybody wants to see and everyone knows what I'm doing. Uh, but in some sense, it's hard to untransform. Um, this gets back to the single source of truth myth where what you're trying to do is right for every line of business. We'll get more into that later. It also precludes any kind of architecture with a raw data store. You constantly, if you've ever heard a data scientist say, what did you do to the data? I just want the raw data, please. I'm sure David said that before. Also, for the traditional ETL, success depends on having all data quality and business needs known upfront. 
um, and hope that they don't change frequently um, because the, the traditional ETL changes are difficult to apply. Tables have to be reloaded. And also it leads to what I call, something I call ETL fiefdoms where you don't really know what's going on. It's only the ETL developer who created the routines who really knows and understands what's going on between extraction and load. So with these traditional approaches, um, what we found um, is just throwing an agile product delivery method on top of uh, to delivering a modern data ecosystem uh, on top of the traditional approaches doesn't make it as agile analytics. Uh, this really goes a lot back to the traditional methods, you having to understand all the data in the source and know all the use cases up front before you can begin. And you really don't start getting business value until the end. Uh, another thing, this goes back to the simple fact that you don't get stuff, you don't get things, for, it's hard to get things right the first time. And so the more iterative your approach, the more successful you're gonna be. Enter Data Vault. Here we go. All right, so Data Vault at its simplest form, it's a data modeling technique. I prefer to refer to it as a framework or a methodology. It is business key focused. So it's, it is focused on business key integration to the raw data vault. The raw data vault sits there in the middle. We're getting to that more in a, in a bit. So what is a business key? A business key, it's a little hard to find, but it's any source system identifier. Um, and it's really anything that the business accepts as a key. I'm thinking things like employee ID, account ID, customer ID. Now these eventually translate into, like I said, data vault is also a modeling, data modeling technique. So business keys eventually translate um, into something we call hubs, which is the type of table in the raw data vault. Now data vault also attracts the full fidelity of the history of the source system changes. So you have full history of those tables or files that you have ingested. Now this modeling technique of focusing on business key integration is really key as far as it helps avoid the pitfalls of the other traditional methods. And what I mean by that is really the hang up is with things like the, the, the relationships between keys. And, and so this is like in the inman and in the um, dimensional modeling um, data modeling techniques, you're constantly having these arguments, especially with dimensional modeling. Okay, do we represent this as a one-to-many or as a one-to-one? -one? And then even, even in the minimum model, you're constantly having to make a decision about, do you refactor later with a one-to-one -one, or just do you accommodate one-to-many in the beginning? And so this, the other key besides the business key is the business key relationships accommodating the many-to-many -many relationships. The data vault allows for the full audit trail from source to raw data vault. This is a key in a highly regulated business like banking finance. It leans heavily on the ELT, that's extract load transformation data movement pattern. So what we try to do is we try to avoid early transformations. We push these soft business rules or these transformations to the right. If you're looking at from source left to consumption to the right. All right. and so. Raw data vault is all the history. There's no dependency on the single source of truth. What we have here is a single source of facts. And so you gotta think about, um, you have different lines of businesses and different lines of businesses. At the end of the day, a lot of them, they wanna see the data in different ways. Now, things like MDM can help bring that in line to a certain extent, but you know, at some point marketing doesn't want to see customer the same way as finance, as risk. Lines of business has different, different perspectives. So if you have a single source of facts to go back to, you can only have, always have these different perspectives, which is the, uh, the different sources of truth. Now, with the raw data vault, uh, ultimately, when just one last thing on this, um, the raw data vault ultimately is not necessarily has business value in itself. It's really in those layers off to the right here. You see this information delivery. That's where we have our star schemas, where you still have a Ralph Kimball dimensional model, 
you have your, your report ready tables and report ready layers over there. And that's where the consumption usually takes place. All right, next slide. So all these features um, of the two different major buckets of methodology comparisons, your more traditional analytics and then this agile analytics approach, um, all are great. And ultimately in selecting, we need to identify which ones map back to our primary client needs. Um, so you know, first and foremost, there's an immediate need for analytics. Um, so through the agile analytics approach, um, you know, we're not boiling the ocean. We're able to decide what's going to be consumed. Uh, and focus on rapid delivery of those data elements, right? Uh, build in, they will come, they won't always actually come. Uh, second, we wanna make sure that we're integrating multiple source systems. Uh, and so while both either technique can obviously accommodate multiple source systems, the additive nature of uh, Data Vault in particular um, meshes well with an agile team structure. So you can actually start parallelizing development as opposed to working more in a sequential you know, waterfall methodology, uh, even if you're, you know, quote unquote, agile uh, in your scrum teams. The third main piece here, of course, is, is your audibility. We're working the financial sector, and as, as Brett mentioned, that's being able to examine, um, offer to examiners, rather, this clear data lineage uh, is paramount. Uh, and it's much more transparent in a data vault environment uh, when you have exact copies stored within your source environment, you can use these very clear patterns of development to recreate from the report uh, the original source system, as opposed to a more traditional approach that tends to have much more complex structures and ETL patterns. Uh, and then lastly, looking at something that is scalable and extensible. Um, a lot of these smaller companies, particularly with a large uh, growth velocity, uh, might be looking at mergers and acquisitions or being acquired themselves. Uh, so being able to um, iterate and to scale based on the business need and also have a solution that is extensible for future needs uh, is very important. And that additive design of Data Vault uh, really does well without having to go through some of the more extensive code refactoring practices that take place with a centralized data warehouse. So um, those are the four sort of primary reasons why uh, you know, Data Vault for our, our composite client here is what we would want to go with. Uh, but how do we actually achieve this vision through Agile Analytics? OK, thanks, David. So Data Vault in itself is not an architecture. It's not an implementation. Um, and so what we need to hear is a architecture. So this is our composite client conceptual architecture. It's really the independent of the deployment or the, the, the physical implementation. And so I do, um, we're not gonna go through this in depth. I do please refer you to Tara Mason and John Pumlet's discussion on delivering business value with a modern data ecosystem back in September. This is a, a flavor of uh, that reference architecture that they went over there. I will make some notes as far as um, we do let's see. Um, there are things on here that are not part of the initial use case delivery for this composite client, such as this dream hub, the master data management. Um, there's those are things that are not part of um, the initial use cases, but they're on the reference architecture for that future capability. Um, also note, I talked about this earlier, data moves from left to right. Um, I'm big on that as far as when I say pushing things right um, and sourcing things from the left. And uh, we do have a data lake on here, um, but that is purely for purposes of a persistent staging area. And we'll get more into data lakes in a minute. Let's go ahead and next slide. And so here's how we're gonna solve this problem for our client. So first of all, we start with explicit business intent, we're going to start with an explicit business need. And that is the balance sheet that they need at first. So we're only going to model and ingest the data that is necessary to fulfill that business capability. All right. And so what we do, we delivered a balance sheet based upon one source for the client. Uh, now, get, this is just one source, but um, I don't know if we mentioned this, but in this case, the client didn't have the history tracking that um, in the source system that there was necessary to be able to complete the balance sheet. And so that's where in the raw data vault, we have the data to meet that business need. What, what do we do next, David? 
Okay. All right. So we have the ability to adapt to changing business needs with without refactoring the raw data vault. So I'm thinking of three different scenarios here. One, we had a change in business requirements. What did we have to do? We didn't have to go back to the start. We have all the data in the raw data vault. All we had to do was make a change into our business consumption layer to be able to, able to accommodate that change in business need or business requirement. Or perhaps we had a different line of business when a different perspective on the balance sheet, less likely, but in that perspective, we could have added another report collection and an additional balance sheet to be able to meet that need. Or what's more likely is we screwed up the balance sheet. We, we got it wrong and we failed. And this happens all the time. Um, and with these um, type of implementations, you know, it's hard, things go wrong, but with an incre incremental delivery of a, of a data vault, we don't have to go back to the source. We don't have to go back to stage. All we have to do is make those corrections in the layers to the right where the error occurs. Because after all, we all fail. I can think of the first time that I gave my data vault presentation. It was definitely a crash and burn. And that happens. What happened the second time? The second time I gave the presentation? Uh, I don't know, but it's looking pretty good so far. So regardless of, of how we failed, um, we have to remember that we didn't have to change our extraction pipelines. We didn't have to refactor the raw data vault. We didn't have to do remodeling. <laughs> okay, I'm just looking at the chat window here from uh, my, my, my boss from 20 years ago. Okay, and then let's go on to the next one. So what else did we do? We actually gave our client self-service and not out of the report collection, but out of, of a dimensional model, a star schema. Now, we didn't have to source new data. We didn't have to add new data to the raw data vault. This is additional, uh, this is additional capability out of the same data set from the raw data vault in, in the manner of self-service. All right, and then what did we do? We got that uh, predictive and analytic. There we go, look at that, okay. The next thing we did, we actually injected new sources. So this is where a data vault, well, any analytical environment really comes into um, accelerating its value. It's really in the integration of additional disparate source systems. So what we happened here, we added two more sources. We didn't have to change the raw data vault because it's additive, the data model is additive. So we added additional um, hubs, links, and, um, and satellites to the raw data vault for additional capabilities. And what we're doing here is we're doing our predictive and predictive modeling out of the raw data vault. David's gonna to touch on this later. Um, but as you can see here, it's an incremental delivery. So the key takeaways besides, you know, it's the iterative nature of it, the repeatable patterns help expedite the development process and it's adaptive. It's adaptive to the change in source systems as well as changes in a business. And it's also adaptive to the, just not getting the right the first time. All right, so let's talk a little more about um, the modeling. This is where we try to go a little bit deeper into Data Vault and a little bit about the ELT versus ETL. Okay, so as we talked about, Data Vault is business key focused. And so the two goals are to be able to integrate the business keys in the raw Data Vault and to be able to recreate the source from the frequency in which you ingest it. And so what we do with our data vault implementations, if we can recreate the source on a daily basis, we've won. That means you have that full history, that full fidelity. Another thing we, uh, we have here, so we have our three kinds of primary raw data vault tables, the hub, the link, and the satellite. The hub, as I talked about earlier, is really um, the, the business key. And so in this case, we go from, um, and so we'll see that in a subsequent slide. So the links are really are the relationships between the business keys and the satellites are the all the all the other attributes that are not the hub or the link. And so let's look at a specific example for this composite client. For one, let's just say this is a table called account. If that is one table in the source system, we're gonna stage, have one staging table. I'm gonna load that to the raw data vault as into four different tables. One is the hub account. Another is the hub customer. 
And then those are the two business keys, the account ID and the customer ID. And then we have a link, which is the relationship between the account and the customer, accounting for the many to many relationship should the need arise. Now the satellite account is all the other attributes from that account table in the source system that are not either the hub account or the hub customer. So it's hub business key link is a relationship between business keys. Satellite is everything else. All right, moving on. So this is a little bit deeper. Um, and what I wanna highlight here is really the different layers, the source stage raw data vault. You have something called a business vault, an information mark, a business layer. layer. All these layers aren't necessarily materialized. They're not necessarily all tables. Um, our methodology is we like to virtualize to our hertz as far as the layers in the information mark and business layer. These are all tables, by the way. This is a, this is a, data, this is a modeling technique. Um, the, uh, as far as uh, the business layer goes, that's where the, primarily the consumption um, of either for reporting or for the traditional analytics, file extracts, all that comes out of the business layer. And this is also where we can represent those different perspectives to the business. And if that's virtualized, it's easy. Okay, marketing wants to see it one way. Finance wants to see it a different way. Okay, we give them two different views, literally different views of the same data. And this is also in the business layer on the right where we focus on security as far as if that's where people are accessing the data, you really lock down everything else. And then you look at your granular level security within the business layer. It's also where we focus on metadata um, you can boil the ocean, you can have metadata for every data element in your ecosystem. Good luck, we'll see you um, in 2060. It's just not gonna happen. We spend the effort on metadata in the business layer. That's where it's, that's where it's consumed. That's where the metadata is most valuable. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So automation and acceleration. And so as David mentioned, I've mentioned, Data Vault is ripe for parallelization as well as automation. There's really only a handful of different loading patterns and modeling techniques um, to, to the point where it's low hanging fruit for automation. There are some things like, like the business layer um, or really the extraction where you really wanna stay out of the game of automation as far as there's no two source system is, is the same. You might be doing CDC on one source system, it might be a full extract on another. It's uh, difficult to try to automate the extraction. The business layer, that's unique to your business. Um, some people play in that space, uh, we don't. We really wanna stick with the automation acceleration um, in between the data lake and into the raw data vault. Um, another place we play is in the data validation, as far as we talked about earlier about trying to recreate the source. What we found is, um, is along with automating the pipelines to, to load the raw data vault, we also can automate the validation of that data. And um, one thing I didn't mention earlier uh, is in data vault, there's a different concept between data validation and data quality. Data quality is an assumption uh, that is best left to the hands of business, not to the engineers. Um, whereas data validation, we're really looking at, did what we, what we loaded to the raw data vault, was that was what we extracted from the source system. And data quality, we pushed that to the right, as far as in subsequent layers in the business layer, that's where we really enforce data quality measures based upon business input not from what Brett thinks that data should, should look like. And as far as acceleration, um, we found we've gone from automation and in fact makers to acceleration. We do at this point we do code generation. We have a tool we call a Rapid Vault, which we use to accelerate data vault implementations. So with that, uh, Brett has built a beautiful data vault uh, now that I can leverage for analysis, uh, exploratory analysis, report development, and model development. Um, similar in the same way that the, the data vault doesn't have to be um, completely built, we don't need to wait for some sort of monolith data warehouse before we can begin the analytics um, process. We can kind of work in concert um, and continuing that sort of agile development patterns. So. Once we have some data to work with, how do we deliver for the business using the data vault? 
So returning for a second um, back to this architectural um, structure here that Brett walked us through of our client, um, I, I think you could probably start to see uh, exactly how we would do it. In fact, um, I would say that it's, it's fairly self-evident that you start with a business layer, right? And, and that can be structured in a way that's very familiar both for BI tools and BI report developers uh, and use um, you know, those Kimball star schema-like structures uh, that those tools are designed to use and consume. Um, so from that rapid development there, that also frees up a lot more time for data analysis, exploratory analysis, and uh, the design of activities. So how explicitly would we do that with data vault? Um, so I think it's kind of important to, to pause for a second and maybe consider some of the other alternatives that are out there. So most popular one really is, is, is working with a data lake, right? And so conceptually what's happening here is you're taking all of your various operational systems and dumping them into a data lake, right? Uh, you have, uh, if done correctly, um, you know, an unadulterated full data fidelity, uh, exact copies from your source system that you can have all the history and granularity that they provide uh, in the original data formats. Um, it is, again, if done correctly with correct MDM, uh, very navigable, right? Querying for the, the specific fields that you like from the data catalog, identifying where they live and, and working and bringing those into your data model from this flat structure. Um, it is extremely cost-effective with a very, uh, very uh, expedient um, time to value. You know, you're, you're moving data into a data store. There's, there isn't really any modeling taking place. Um, and so you can get up and running very quickly. And, you know, of course, there are some performance advantages uh, to this technique over some older systems as well. So with this in mind, um, you know, kind of like to think, well, uh, you know, how, how could we draw on some of these strengths? Um, you know, it's important to consider, though, that there are some disadvantages to this technique. If you don't do it correctly, uh, you can end up with a very highly uh, regulated standpoint environment rather from a data governance standpoint or bad data conversely, uh, or it's undefined, um, or you have quality issues because the data is not validated on ingest. And of course, you do have um, some, some potential issues uh, with private, privacy concerns, how permissions can be allocated across the data lake. So if you take some of those positives there, uh, we start back again with this data lake. Well, essentially, what is the data lake? As Brett noted earlier, to an extent, it, it's a persistent staging area. Uh, so we have full fidelity of all of our source systems. And if we consider then, you know, perhaps what if we added in uh, some master data management components um, that allow to replicate the same sort of navigable structure. And I think you guys can see where we're going with this here. You're recreating the core components of a data vault um, with you know, the caveat that, that performance uh, is a function of your architecture and, and your underlying technologies, not necessarily your, your data modeling techniques. And, and data vault is a modeling technique. Um, so working with that, let's step back and think again about this example of, of how we might, as data scientists, uh, leverage this data environment for analysis and modeling purposes. So you have the advantages of having this full fidelity of your data in a very navigable structured environment. Environment You can already see within the raw data vault how um, common business keys from different source systems are integrated into the same table without loss of, of, of history um, and really just a more convenient structure to work with as opposed to having these you know, labyrinth of, of, um, of queries as you're gathering the data and, moving um, more from that 80% data munging, wrangling time break, break, breakdown for a data scientist and lowering that to focus really where your comparative advantage exists. Uh, it's important to note though, that, you know, as you move towards the right in development, you still have that availability of, of refined data for the BI developer. And as you move to the left, you still have the raw um, source system data for your machine learning engineers and data scientists. Um, with all these common features to the data vault, you also have, or the, to the data lake rather, you also have the added benefits um, that come with implementation of the, the data vault uh, methodology uh, inside of a RDBMS system, right? So you have um, the access control and data validation that takes place in the ingest, right? There's the fine column structures uh, and data types to those columns. Uh, so if there's a bad load, you're, you're gonna know about it. Um, 
And also and probably an important piece that's often understated within the data lake itself. Yes, it's a fantastic central repository, but you lose that integration component that takes place uh, like we see here inside of the raw data vault. So uh, with those elements in mind, we're able to really just deliver in that iterative um, fashion for our clients. So, right. All right, so it looks like we won as far as we delivered business value in a timely manner and our clients has happy. And how we do it? It was all about time to value. It was all about a solution that is tailored to the client needs. Uh, with these things, there's no one size fits all. And we did it in an incremental fashion. We failed early and we learned and we got to a holistic scalable solution. Not only that, in this specific example, we have an architecture that supports not only the, um, well, for all analytics, um, as opposed to having something that's broken up and more segmented. So, um, I, David, you asked how, how it went the second time, I think pretty well. Uh, well let's go ahead and open up, up for, for questions. So we got a good question here, Brett. When it, when is Data Vault not a good fit? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm I'm a hammer for every, it's everything's a nail, but that's it's not that's not the reality of things. So Data Vault wouldn't be appropriate in a situation where you only have one only have one source, or if you don't really care about history, uh, if you're not really interested um, in. Uh, if you're a situation where you, you're not highly regulated and those other two examples are true. Um, there's also, it's it's a, not niche, but um, it's easier to find a traditional data warehouse architect developer than it is to find someone who knows Data Vault. Uh, so there there is that. Um, but all in all, um, it's a decent solution, not just for analytical environments. It's also used for other, other types of systems uh, beyond just analytics. So you really, you have to um, look and see what the client needs, um, their acceptance um, to things like uh, data quality, um, time to value. So it, I hate to say it, but it really all depends. Absolutely. And, and I might echo there, right, to your point that a more traditional uh, ETL developer um, may not be as familiar with these structures or comfortable. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, coming from a data science background and working on some of these engagements uh, in a data engineering capacity, um, you know, I can, I can certainly appreciate the repeatable nature of the patterns um, that allow individuals that may not have um, the data architecture or data modeling experience uh, to contribute um, to a warehouse development um, leveraging strict coding ability and, and capacity to recognize very simple patterns. So, so Brad, does, uh, does the architecture lend itself to a specific or different tech stack um, or you know, data movement ETL tools? No, and so it, it, it really is, um, tech stack agnostic. Uh, you could even do a data vault on a file based system. Um, so it's um, obviously the, the tools of choice uh, differ um, as far as if you're not doing a whole lot of um, ETL, um, do you really need a sophisticated ETL tool? If you're more interested, interested in things like execution orchestration and just EL. So I think it, um, it definitely factors into the decision making as far as what tools you choose, but it's not, it's definitely, I would say it's tool agnostic. Absolutely. Uh, here's a great question. Um, you know, how would you determine uh, what is a hard business rule versus a soft business rule? Um, in yeah. So I, I touched on the concept of a soft business rule earlier. And so in uh, Data Vault, there's hard business rules and soft business rules. Soft business rules are those things, those transformations that we push to the right. We really want those to be business driven with business intent. Um, hard business rules are, um, are applied, these are transformations that are applied between, typically between the stage layer and the raw data vault. 
And so in Path Acreage, what we've come to is we only apply hard business rules on data such that it is necessary to be able to match on business keys. And so thinking uh, through examples like a banking example, mm -hmm. if you have a um, account number that uh, in some systems, one source system is padded with zeros, it's a 12 digit number. In another system, it is, um, there's no padding of zeros. A hard business rule would be something where you would apply padding to be able to match those two business keys, be able to put them into the hub. Another example would be of a hard business rule would be a social security number where in one system you might have dashes and another system you wouldn't. And so what you wanna do is be able to, you would manipulate that data to be able to accommodate matching. So typically we also like to also keep another attribute that is the source as well. So you really don't wanna lose, the, the key is you don't wanna lose any data on the way they're all data vault. Because it gets back to you don't, you wanna be able to recreate the source. You want to be able to know what happened to the data. Yeah, additional question related to project management methodology. Um, you know, in particular, uh, this is asking about, does this particular solution lend itself uh, to a, an agile project management um, process? And yeah, absolutely would be the, the simple answer to that. Um, you know, as, we, as we noted, um, Data Vault is uniquely advantaged um, because you can not only employ a agile project methodology uh, to the management of the project, the sourcing of business requirements, uh, but also to the, the coding and development, development itself. Um, because of that, you know, kind of extensible additive uh, nature of the architecture, um, you're able to paralyze the process across multiple teams um, or across you know, within the same team across multiple developers. And as uh, changes uh, occur or arise as a result of changes in business requirements, feedback from the business, et cetera, um, the, the code refactoring is, is far less substantial. I won't say non-existent, but certainly far less substantial uh, than you'll see in more traditional data warehousing uh, techniques. A huge thank you to Brett and David for, for presenting and thank you to all of our attendees for joining. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. All right, thank you all.